Well, it is such a blessing to be here today. It's an humbling thing to stand before you and to speak the oracles of God, to be God's spokesman, so to speak, in revealing the message of his word to you. But what a great encouragement it is for me to know that you are family in Christ, brothers and sisters, that we share a common bond together in Christ, a common love, a common goal for things that are eternal. And to be able to be with you and especially to see some who are very near and dear to me, good friends I've known for some just a few years, some many years, it is a delight to be here to know that we can be edified and encouraged and build up in our faith. I commend the Brown Trail Congregation for hosting these lectures, helping to reaffirm our commitment to the gospel, that the truth can go forth from here, and that the world can see what the gospel of Christ is all about, not just through the messages that are presented, but in the hearts that are represented here and how we live our lives, not just here, but when we leave this building and interact with them. So what a joy it is for me to be with you today. Perhaps it's the pace of modern living. Perhaps it's fear. Perhaps it's the fact that we live in a sin-filled world which can harden hearts and cause the love of many to grow cold. Or maybe it's just a combination of these and other factors, but people can indeed act in an uncaring fashion towards one another. All we have to do is pick up a newspaper or watch the evening news or read from the internet. The stories of some who see others in need are untouched by it and how they respond to it just remind us of how detached some people can be. A number of years ago, there was a lady in uh, Washington State and it just riveted in my mind. I've never been able to forget it. How she was suffering from a great number of issues in her life, and she climbed a bridge and was intending to take her life. Police had worked three hours trying to talk her down from that bridge. They'd even gotten one of her friends to come and try to reason with her and let her know that, that her life still had value. It wasn't worth her jumping in the river and forfeiting her life. But you see, this all happened at rush hour. And because of the situation her distress had caused and being on that bridge, they had blocked off one lane of traffic. And the police reported as people drove by, they would roll down their windows and encourage her to jump so people could get home and go on with their life. And the police report said that that was some of the mild things that were said to her. And in the final analysis, she listened more to those uncaring people who were disturbed by getting home a little bit late that evening than she did those who were trying to show concern for her, and she jumped to her death. You may be more familiar with a young man in England not too long ago who climbed to the top of a parking garage and was threatening to jump, and how a group of young people underneath it began chanting and encouraging him to do so. They were yelling things like, jump, let's see how high you can bounce. And he did. And then when he lay there, they ran up with their camera phones to take pictures of him after he had committed suicide. This may be true of the attitude some have towards others in our world, but our Lord graphically illustrates to us this should not be so. And when we look at the story of the Good Samaritan. We understand that same hardness of heart, man's inhumanity to man was present even during our Lord's lifetime. Jesus said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. By chance, a certain priest came down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. His own countrymen did not want to have any involvement, any concern for his needs. It was that Samaritan who came where he was, and when he saw him, he felt compassion for him. Compassion or pity is something that we still show to others, usually those who are close to us, those that we have a connection with, those who mean something to us. 
It's something that certainly we desire at times of difficulty in our lives that we want others to show us. But as Christians, we need to go beyond the typical kind of response you might expect of others in the world. We should have a different perspective regarding compassion. One that conforms to the example that was set for us by the Lord. I'm reminded of what Paul said in Philippians 2 and verse 5 when he was writing about doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. The answer to the problem, he said, was let each one have this mind, this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind of Christ and the heart of Christ. And compassion certainly is one of those attributes which our Lord demonstrated during his ministry upon earth and showed us the type of attitude we should have towards one another. But before we begin talking about and, and illustrating the type of compassion Christ had and, and that he felt and that he showed towards us, I think it would be good for us to understand just exactly what we talk about when we use that term, compassion. In the original Greek, there are several different terms that are used to describe the attitude of compassion. Interestingly, each one emphasizes a different yet essential aspect of what compassion encompasses. One term is translated mercy or pity, and it speaks of the emotions that are to be aroused by contact with an infliction that someone may have which has come upon them undeservedly. Over in Mark, the 10th chapter, as Jesus was making his way towards Jerusalem while he was in the village of Jericho, we are told in verse 46, he was moving along with his disciples in a great multitude, and, and blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's the term that we're looking at. He wanted Jesus to be emotionally aroused by the condition that he saw in him. Look at me, is basically what he was saying. Look at what I have been reduced to. Look at what my blindness has led to in my life. I, I have to been reduced to sitting here. And when I detect someone passing by on the road, I'm reduced to, to begging for my life to have any sustenance at all. Look at me. Feel what it must be like for me to be this way. Show compassion towards me. The, the feelings that go out when we see someone that, that has that kind of need. Another term is translated have pity or to show mercy. To feel sympathy. And it's different from what we've just talked about, the, the feelings that are the emotions that are being aroused. Because, you know, sometimes you can look at someone with a need or, or someone in distress, and, and there can be different types of emotional responses to a person. Some people's hearts may go out to them while other people look at it and they're repulsed by what they see. The, the condition becomes repugnant to them. They, they become angered that they may have to, to look at this or to deal with this or, or have to try to cope with what they see in an individual. But this term denotes being moved inwardly. It's a positive response. It's not just raw feelings being released. It's, it's to be moved from the heart. And so to a feel affection, to, to feel love because of those needs of that individual and knowing what is going on in their lives. You want the perfect illustration of this? Go to the story of the prodigal son, Luke, the 15th chapter and verse 20. When that prodigal had determined that he would be better off in his father's home as a servant than where he was in the pig pen, starving with no one there to help him. He arose and came to his father. But we know the heart of the father, don't we? When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Don't you know that father was feeling something when he saw that son he had been longing to see came into view. Don't you know his heart was moved knowing he was coming home? Don't you know the love that he felt for him? And that's why he ran and embraced him and kissed him. It, it's not just the emotions being aroused. It's the generation of love. It's, it's the heart being engaged because of the condition and need of the individual. 
Another term that is used is translated compassion or sympathy. And it denotes the ability to suffer with another, to be affected similarly as what that person must be feeling, to, to show compassion because we are part of humanity and we have difficulties. And, and while what this individual is having to deal with may not be the same as what our trials and struggles may be, yet we know what trials and struggles are. And so our, our heart goes out and we're touched and, and we want to do something. We want to help. We want to respond to that need. Over in 1 Peter, the third chapter in verse 8, Peter speaks of this when he exhorts us, all of you be of one mind, have compassion for one another. And I don't think he's just talking about the, the feelings, but he's talking about the response that those feelings and the heart that is touched is to generate, to, to help with that need, to help eliminate the suffering, to, to reach out and show how much we care by helping in the ways that we can. So love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, don't return evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, a blessing, knowing you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Now, these terms do not indicate three different kinds of compassion. You don't get to pick which type of compassion you want to show. Really, there are three key elements of compassion. It's a composite picture. When we look at these three terms and we combine them together, there are three essential elements that should be involved every time we show compassion. Each of these qualities should be present when compassion is present. Our emotions should be aroused by the, the suffering and the need that we see in an individual. We, we should be moved from the heart. There should be a genuineness and, and a sincerity about how we feel towards them and, and understanding the human condition and relating to the need that they have. We should be willing to empathize and to entering into that suffering with them. If we're genuinely going to show compassion, if we're going to help, if we're going to get involved, if we're going to do what we can on their behalf. I think that's what Paul was talking about, Romans 12 and verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. It shouldn't be crocodile tears that we shed when we see the need someone has. We shouldn't just look at them and go, oh boy, isn't that a shame, and go away as untouched as before we came in contact with that need. You know, when we look at the events over in Matthew, the 17th chapter, when Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration and there is confronted with the disciples over a man and his boy who was demon-possessed, the debate that was going on between the, the Pharisees and Jesus' disciples, they couldn't cast the demon out, and, and now there was a debate raging between the two of them about it. And you know, there had to be a degree of frustration in, in Jesus' heart because here is someone with a need, and, and they're debating the mechanics of the situation. But Jesus looks through to the need that existed with that child, and it's interesting how the Father appealed to Christ on his behalf. And, Matthew 17 and verse 15, he said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic and suffers severely. He often falls into the fire, often into the water. The demon was, was producing symptoms of seizures and things similar to that, and he became uncontrollable, and he was doing himself physical harm. Lord, have mercy. See, let your heart be touched. Re relate to what this is doing to him. But it wasn't just the emotion he was speaking of, because when we look at the parallel account over in Mark, the ninth chapter, and with verse 22, there the text tells us that the father said, often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help. It's not just, I brought him here so you would feel sorry for him. I brought him here that your heart would be touched and if you can, you would help. If you can do anything, please help us. Isn't it wonderful to know that's the type of compassion that the Father and the Son have towards us? Compassion is described as being a, a characteristic of both God and Jesus. 
2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3, God is described as being the Father of mercies. And we'll come back to that passage before we end our lesson in just a little bit. But the mercy, the compassion that God feels for us, we know the depth at which his heart is touched and, and how much he helps us because he sent his son on our behalf. And we know the depth of, of compassion and pity and mercy that the son has for us because he was willing to come in the flesh to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. But you know, the compassion of Christ isn't just seen when he gets to the cross. That certainly is the greatest example of his compassion, to, was the need that, that our sins had created, the need for forgiveness. Did it, did it touch his heart? Yes. He was willing to come and to die on the cross that that need could be fulfilled. That, that is the epitome of what sympathy and compassion is. The feelings that he had towards us, is his heart reaching out towards us, seen in his willingness to be nailed to the cross and to die for us. But if you look all through his earthly ministry, we shouldn't be surprised that he went to the cross. Because in showing himself to be the Son of God and in fulfilling his ministry, his life was filled with compassion on behalf of the people that he interacted with, that he dealt with. He could have revealed himself through the miracles as the Son of God in a variety of ways. He could have performed feats over nature, which he did. He could have done other things, but it is most interesting that we are touched by when to show himself the Son of God, he interacted with other human beings in a way that would be beneficial to them, in a way that would be a help and a strength and an encouragement to them as well. Over in Luke, the seventh chapter with verse 11, Jesus and his disciples went into a city called Nain. There was a large crowd there, as there typically was early on in the ministry of Christ, his earthly ministry, the novelty of what he was doing, the curiosity so many had about him. But when he came near the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. And when Jesus saw this funeral procession and knew the condition that existed, when he saw her, the text tells us, he had compassion on her. Do you think when, when he saw the grieving mother, when he knew what that would do to her, no one else to help provide and care and help her. When he saw the numbers that were there with her, do you not think his heart was touched? Do you not think his, his heart went out, he could empathize with what she was going through? And he wanted to help her in that need. That was all part of the compassion that he felt. He told her, do not weep. And he touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, arise. And he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. And before he revealed his power as the Son of God and testified to the work that he had come to do, his heart reached out to someone that he cared about to help her in her need. What about the events in John, the 11th chapter? It was Lazarus when he had passed away. Jesus went there knowing he was going to raise him from the dead. And when he saw Mary and Martha and the grief that had struck them over the loss of their brother and the words they were speaking to him, Lord, if you had just been here, you could have healed him. He didn't rebuke them for that. He didn't state that they were silly. He didn't say, you know, I, I'm the son of God. I came here to take care of things. Quit, quit showing such silly emotions over this. Shortest verse in the New Testament. Shortest verse in the Bible. Touches our hearts today, doesn't it? Knowing he was going to raise him from the dead, and yet when he saw the grief and the sorrow and the feeling of loss these friends of his had, Jesus wept. Was his heart touched by the suffering of humanity? Was his desire to, to help and do what he could to comfort them? He spoke words of encouragement to them before he went to raise him 
from the dead. How many more examples could we multiply of Jesus reaching out and showing us that his coming to offer himself as the ultimate act of compassion, showing his love by going to the cross and granting us forgiveness of sins, that it just wasn't going through the motions. Yeah, 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 I'm here. I've got to do a few things. I've got to get this done. Then I'll offer myself and I'm out of here. That wasn't his attitude about the work God had given him to do. He came willingly. And he dealt with each one according to the needs they had. Now, you might say Matthew 23, when he was speaking to the Pharisees, was kind of a tough compassion. It was a verbal two-by-four, wasn't it? Woe to you, scribe and Pharisees, hypocrites! But it was a language he knew that could at least get them to see and listen and perhaps touch their heart. And he did that out of as much concern for them as he did at the woman taken in adultery when his heart went out to her as well. So that we can sum up with the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 4 and verse 15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Isn't it a comfort to know that, that when we approach Scripture and we see the life of Christ, when we think about him being our mediator, when we go to the Father in prayer, and we lay out our heart's petitions and our needs and the troubles and the difficulties and all that is going on in our lives. We know he cares. We know he understands because he has walked on this earth. He was human. He was tempted. He knows what the experiences of life are all about. And because he lived that sinless life, he knows perfectly how to help us to overcome, to endure, to find our way through the trials and difficulties we have, to give us assurance he's with us through it all today and has something so wonderful and so beautiful waiting for us in eternity. As qualities of the Heavenly Father and the Savior, when we think about the compassion that he showed, we understand if we have the mind of Christ, if we are following in his example, compassion should be characteristic of us as his children, should be characteristic of us as Christians. Over in Colossians, the third chapter, and with verse 12, Paul there reminds us, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, we are to put on tender mercies. One translation states, have a heart of compassion. And that's the thought that Paul is trying to communicate. And the qualities that follow pretty much describe and help explain what all that means. We're to have kindness and humbleness of mind and meekness and long-suffering. We should be bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is a bond of perfection and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. If that's the, the heart of compassion, if that's the tender mercies, if that's the spirit we possess, that those qualities follow through, we will care for one another. We will be in tune with each other's needs. We will be moved when we see the, the problems and difficulties that come along our way from time to time. Our heart will be engaged. We will empathize. We will enter into that with them. We will be willing to, to weep if they are weeping. We will want to help if there is any way that we can be engaged and not just showing support but in being willing to, to provide for those needs as best we can. And knowing that if we show that kind of love for others, that there will be others who will be there for us when the difficulties and the trials of life come our way. What are some of the virtues that, that Christian compassion should impart to us, should give to us? What should the world be able to see among us as a testimony that Christ really is alive in our hearts? 
Compassion encompasses the emotions, but it goes beyond the, the, just the feelings and the sentimentality. Compassion should motivate us to act and to serve. Short book of Jude, beginning in verse 22, he states, Have compassion, making a distinction, or some translations say who are doubting. There are those who, who may not have a physical need, but it's their faith that needs to be strengthened. It's their faith that needs to be encouraged. It, it's their faith through some of the trials and temptations and, and struggles that they have spiritually that we need to show compassion for. Our hearts should go out to them because we're tempted too. It may not be the same thing that they're tempted with, but we know what it's like to be tempted. We know what it's like to, to struggle to overcome problems with our lives. And we should be there to want to help them through those times. So we have compassion. Others we save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. We hate the sin, but we love the sinner. And we want to help them find their way back to a right relationship with God. Back into his love and mercy. Because none of us here should ever be content thinking there is a brother or sister who has wandered from the way and may wind up in hell. We should never become complacent to think that those who have known the salvation of God may forfeit that for eternity because hell is forever and our hearts should be touched and we should strive to reach out they have the choice whether to return or not but we should love them enough we want them to come back and we make the effort to engage them and to bring them back to people who truly should love them and care for them like no one else does. You know, without compassion, we will not be able to see the world as our Lord does. We will not be able to respond as he would have us to respond. We won't be able to fulfill the work he has given us to do in the way that he would have us to do it. Remember when we talked about in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3 that Paul reminds us God is a father of mercies. He's the God of all comfort. And then in verses 4 and 5 he tells us that he comforts us in all our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Sometimes the comfort God affords is dressed in flesh just as he did through the Son. So we can be his agents at showing his love and mercy towards others. Why? Because we have been shown his mercy as well. And as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. That just as we've had comfort from God and we know how much that means to us, we can help others find that comfort in their lives as well. Brethren, it just disturbs me when someone turns away from the truth and I have someone come to me and says, well, I, I knew they wouldn't stay faithful to begin with. They can just lightly discard someone like that and, and feel justified and, and smug in the thoughts that they had about that person coming to pass rather than it breaking their heart and wanting to do something to help. Or someone that has a, a physical need and we don't want to be touched by it. We're no different than the people James spoke of illustrating faith and works in James too. Be at peace. Be warmed and be filled. I don't know anybody that got fat off a diet of adverbs when that's all that you give them and you have the means to help and you don't show them that kindness. Our faith is dead at that point in time. We don't really understand the love of God or we would be motivated to respond. And then there are times when, unfortunately, there are preachers who seem to delight in other pre preachers going astray. I remember several lectureships in the past I attended and some of the speakers would speak of a well-known brother who was faithful and no longer is. He called him every 
derogatory term I can remember. He cast all kinds of invectives against this individual. Called him sniveling, snot-filled, all sorts of things. And then he said, oh, but you know I love him. Now don't mistake what I'm saying. We're to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. But we're also to speak the truth in love. And our hearts should be moved when someone who has been of service in the Lord's kingdom and leading people to Christ now is leading people away. And we need to pray for those individuals. And if we have the opportunity to make contact, we need to remind them what the truth is and what they are doing to their souls and other souls. Because I don't think God wants them lost either. And I think he still does not take delight in the death of the wicked. In the world today, there is pain and anguish and need and suffering in so many ways. We contact it in our own lives. It's around the lives of others that we know so much, we can kind of become anesthetized to it. We become untouched by it. We become cold and heartless and uncaring. But if we're to be Christ-like, then we need to see through the eyes of Jesus. We need to develop the compassion of Jesus if we're to have a, a positive influence in the lives of others. If we're going to be able to care for others and their souls. If we're going to show them a concern that reaches to eternity. I'm reminded of that phrase, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And there's a lot of truth in that. When they know we care, then they can have a heart that becomes open to hear what it is we have to say. And to do what it is we can do for them. James tells us in James 5 and verse 11, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Well, may we go forth and do likewise. May we be children of compassion. Because we have the Father of all mercies. And may we show the world around us that there is something better than shouting to someone who is so distraught they're willing to take their life to get on with it, that they have worth and value, that God loves them, that we have a home prepared for us in eternity. Aren't we grateful Jesus had compassion for humanity, that he cares for each one of us personally and individually? Let's have that kind of heart. And let's show to the world what it truly means to be his children. Thank you very much.